Um, I'm Anna Pinedo, a partner in the New York office of Mayor Brown. And um, our topic for today's session is litigation and enforcement developments. This is the third in our, um, our SPAC series. We had um, two sessions which are available on our website and also on our blog. If you'd like to access them, you can um, download the materials from the prior two sessions, as well as um, watch uh, the video from the prior two sessions. Uh, I'm joined by my partner, um, litigation partner, Brian Massengill, uh, based in our Chicago office. And Brian and I are delighted uh, to have with us Professor Michael Klausner from Stanford Law School. Uh, Professor Klausner has written extensively on, on SPACs, um, so we'll be very interested to hear some of his views. A somewhat ambitious agenda, I'm not sure that we're going to get to all of these topics in as much detail as the slides show, so hopefully the slides will be a little bit of a resource for you. Um, we're going to start with a discussion of uh, the multi-plan case in the multi-plan litigation. And I'm just gonna set the scene, Melissa, if we go to slide four and talk a little bit about the structure, which is a structure common really to pretty much every um, spec these days um, before I hand off to Brian to talk about um, the proceeding and uh, the court's decision and we'll bring Mike into the discussion, of course. So the multi-plan uh, transaction involved um, the third in uh, a series of SPACs. It was uh, like so many uh, SPACs, a Delaware uh, corporation. It completed its SPAC IPO. Um, in its IPO, it sold both common, uh, common stock and warrants. And uh, substantially all of the IPO proceeds were placed in a trust account. The SPAC sponsor, uh, which was led by Michael Klein, received a SPAC promote, again, really quite um, common in the SPAC world. And that SPAC promote consisted of shares of Class B common stock and founder's warrants, um, <coughs> pardon me, um, for which um, relatively de minimis consideration had been paid. We'll go on to the next slide. The Class B shares were held by an entity that was controlled by the sponsor, and uh, directors in the SPAC were uh, given uh, shares or interests um, in um, the, uh, the sponsor entity. So Klein controlled the sponsor and had a majority of the Class B shares allocated um, to him, to Klein. So prior to the business combination, it was only the Class B shareholders that could vote on directors. That meant effectively speaking that um, Klein's control of the sponsor really gave him control of the SPAC. With uh, any SPAC, including this one, um, Churchill was required to give the stockholders, the Class A holders, the opportunity to vote in connection with the business combination, and along with that, the right to um, redeem uh, their securities in connection with uh, the business combination transaction. So next slide. The company identified a target, and that target was Multiplan, a healthcare uh, services company. And at the same time that the business combination agreement was announced, the company uh, also announced entry into definitive pipe purchase agreements with institutional investors. In the pipe, the institutional uh, investors agreed to purchase Class A shares, warrants, as well as convertible notes. So the SPAC went ahead, produced a proxy statement in connection with um, getting shareholder approval of the transaction. And at the time of the stockholder meeting date, as you see on the slide, the Class A shares were trading above the SPAC IPO price. When the business combination uh, was completed 
93% of the shares voted in favor of the transaction. Um, so very uh, low redemption rate, very high uh, vote in favor of the transaction. I think that um, obviously very different world from the one that we're experiencing today, where um, the votes uh, being cast in favor of transactions are uh, much, much lower and the redemption rates are extraordinarily high. So maybe with that, um, as a little bit of the background, which again, you know, I have to say, um, but for the class A, class B, which we see in, in up-spec type situations is perfectly um, typical of all SPACs. I'll um, turn things over to Brian to walk us through the crux of, of the case. Yeah, next slide, thank you. Um, so the crux of the case starts with um, in the month after um, the DSPAC transaction in November, 2020, um, Muddy Waters, which is an equity research firm, also it's you know, viewed as and commonly referred to as a short seller. Um, they published a report about MultiPlan, raising questions about its largest customer, United Health Group, which represented 35% of MultiPlan revenues. And they, um, they stated in the report that MultiPlan was, I mean, sorry, that um, its customer, United Health, was developing an in house um, software platform that would compete with. MultiPlan's product and ultimately would replace um, MultiPlan and so that they would allegedly, or per this report, no longer lose their largest customer. Um, on the date of the announcement, and keep in mind, and we'll come back to this later, that this is Muddy Waters um, and they are a short seller. Um, and so on the date that this report came out, the next day, the stock price fell. Uh, down to $6.27 a share. Remember that the redemption price was just over $10 and shortly after it was trading over 11. So a significant stock price decline resulted from this report. Um, uh, after the stock price decline, plaintiffs brought suit in Delaware Chancery Court against basically the sponsors, the company itself, the directors, um, alleging that the proxy statement um, issued in connection with the DSPAC transaction, failed to disclose that United Health uh, was developing Navigard, which they alleged that MultiPlan knew about in advance, and that they were running the risk of losing their largest customer. Um, based on those, you know, that was the main allegation in the complaint that this was known by MultiPlan and was not disclosed in the proxy statement. Um, and then defendants, after receiving this complaint, um, moved to dismiss, um, and as we'll get to the dismiss, the motion to dismiss was essentially denied um, in its entirety with a couple of minor exceptions. Next slide, please. Um, so I think um, I, we'll talk about it, but keep in mind on a motion to dismiss, and, and this becomes significant later, is the court's required to assume all plaintiff's well-pleaded factual allegations are true and not draw all reasonable inferences in the plaintiff's favor. Um, and, and, and I, you'll see that, you know, in the next slide, the next bullet is the court described plaintiff's claims, essentially saying that um, if the class, you know, that the defendants breached their fiduciary duties by prioritizing their personal interests over the class A stockholders. That's the public stockholders who had a redemption right in pursuing the merger. Um, and in connection with that, they issued a false and misleading proxy. I think it's important um, to note that what the court said um, in deciding this case was they say that notably um, Delaware courts had not previously had an opportunity to consider Delaware fiduciary duty law in the SPAC context. And it states in its ruling that it was quote, applying well-worn fiduciary principles to plaintiff's claims in the SPAC context. Um, it is really the first case that is addressing fiduciary duty claims uh, relating to the SPAC structure and for that reason, although it's not binding on the other chance reports, um, it certainly would be viewed as likely being quite persuasive and influential going forward. Um, so that's what we're doing. Next slide, please. Um, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this sort of the corporate law 101 in Delaware, but basically, typically the default on decisions of the board of directors is the business judgment rule. Um, there's exceptions when um, 
the standard won't apply if there's a, you know conflicts of interest that the court will credit um, in a complaint. And in conflicted situations, Delaware courts would apply the entire fairness standard. And that really, it, it shifts the burden. Um, and it, I'll say the best way to consider it in the context of this case, is it makes it extremely difficult if the court determines and find that entire fairness applies to really get rid of a case on a motion to dismiss. Um, if the court has credits conflicts such that entire fairness applies, it's gonna be very difficult to make a case go away early. Um, and that's really the world that we're probably now sitting in after multi-plan. There was two arguments that plaintiffs made as to why entire fairness should apply. Um, first, that it was a conflicted transaction. And second, that the more the majority of the board was conflicted because they were self-interested or not independent. Um, and this is really arguments that result from the SPAC structure itself. Um, so it's, it's actually arguments that essentially, I think, would apply to most, if not all, SPAC transactions. Next slide, please. Um, now, on the conflicted board, so the court concluded that the board was conflicted for two reasons um, in deciding an entire fairness supply. One, it determined that because of a unique benefit received, um, the board was self-interested. Keep in mind, the directors were allocated Class B shares and um, stood to gain if a transaction was uh, completed, but not if the transaction wasn't completed. So they viewed this, the court concluded that the allegations were sufficient for the court to conclude that they had an interest that wasn't aligned with the Class A shareholders. Um, and then second, um, they also conclude, the court also concluded based on the allegations um, that plaintiffs had sufficiently alleged that the boards were conflicted because of their relationships um, with Klein um, and others. So essentially the court didn't view them as being independent. Um, both of these were sufficient in the court's view to determine that there was sufficient conflict such as uh, entire fairness applied. Let's go to the next slide in the actual the ruling of the court. Um, so the, the, the really the crux of the complaint was that because of disclosure violations and not disclosing United Health, um, sort of the, the allegation that United Health relationship would be lost and that that was known uh, prior to the proxy being issued, that, um, that the failure to include that material information in the court's view meant that the Class A shareholders didn't have sufficient information to, um, at the time they were deciding whether to exercise their redemption right. Just keep in mind, they could exercise the redemption right and have gotten out of $10.04 a share, or they could vote in favor of it and stay in the transaction. Um, the court said they were denied sufficient information at the time they were exercising their redemption right, such that that states a claim Sue. Um, now, the court did leave open, as we see here in the bold part, that the conclusion that um, this breach of you know, this, that there's sufficiently stated a breach by the directors um, doesn't address the validity of a hypothetical where disclosure is adequate and the allegations rest solely on the premise that the fiduciaries were necessarily interested in the SPAC structure. So what they're saying is if you strip out that there was um, this, the allegations around a material non-disclosure or a failure to include this material information, the court's not clear that it would have stated a claim. Um, I'll say the risk though is because you have a structure that the court is viewed as being inherently conflicted such that entire fairness applies and you have a motion to dismiss standard where you have to credit the allegations in the complaint and all reasonable inferences, the combination of those two will make it, I would submit, quite difficult to get rid of um, complaints on a motion to dismiss uh, standard. And so when you have somebody like Muddy Waters that issues a report that causes a stock price decline, um, you know, this, this combination of, you know, what, courts use, what the court views as conflicts plus the standard um, that applies, uh, these cases you know, are gonna create real risk uh, that they will continue into litigation, even if it ultimately turns out that the allegations about what was not disclosed proved to be false. Um, so I, I think 
I know Professor Klostner has spent a lot of time studying multi-plan and considering its ramifications. So I think it'd be a good time you know, after that. So let's hear from Professor Klostner and his views. Thank you, Brian. I, I agree with everything Brian has said, and he's, he's left me relatively little to say. So oh. I'll, but I'll say what I have. What I have, I, I think this is a really um, problematic case for sponsors and SPACs. I think it's really should be a welcome case for plaintiffs, and that's that's the way things work. This, the Delaware courts have now opened the door to. Um, claims that disclosure is inadequate. They left open uh, non-disclosure uh, cases. So a duty of loyalty or a, another problem with a, a, a SPAC merger may or may not be as welcome, but clearly a failure to inform shareholders is not going to be dismissed as Brian says. And that's not welcome news, I expect, for sponsors and for uh, SPACs, especially, as the court multi-plan said, when there is a conflict on the part of the sponsor or the board, either one is sufficient, the court said, um, the court's going to take a hard look. Uh, it'll take a hard look at the disclosure, and I think it's going to take a hard look at non-disclosure cases, too, though that gets beyond, I think, our topic for the, for the moment, at least. I'm happy to address that in, in any Q&A. Uh, the structure of a SPAC makes it very, very difficult to avoid a conflict. I, I don't think the sponsor can avoid a, a conflict. I think uh, the practice is to put boards in a conflict situation almost routinely. Their compensation puts them in a conflict situation. And I haven't done a survey of this. I've collected a lot of data on SPACs. I haven't collected data on, on um, board relationships with sponsors, but the ones that I've happened to see are um, very close, have very close relationships between board members and, um, and sponsors. And as I said, as Brian said, their compensation ties their interest to the sponsor, not to the shareholders. So I think, I think, uh, Defendants are in for the entire fairness review, which means the courts are going to take a very hard uh, look at this. So now, what could what uh, Brian may be about to talk about this next? I'll, I'll begin though. What can a what can a SPAC do? I think I think their hands are tied to a large extent. The sponsor is not going to be able to eliminate its conflict. I don't think. Well, let me say this: given the current structure of SPACs, if SPACs trade change their structure very substantially, then we'd be in a different ball game. And if anybody wanted to do that, I'd happy to be happy to talk to them about it. I think there are ways that can be done, but that would be an entirely new SPAC. Um, absent that, I don't think they can change the structure. Another problem with their structure is that the shareholder vote doesn't really do them any good. Um, first of all, these cases are premised on a failure to inform the shareholder vote, but separately, the shareholder vote is affected by the fact that many shareholders hold warrants. Uh, many shareholders redeem and vote in favor. You can tell that by just looking at the numbers of redemptions and the number of, of votes in favor. So the shareholder vote, uh, I know the, you know the plaintiffs in multi-plan, the plaintiffs in a, another case I'll tell you about um, made a big deal out of the overwhelmingly positive shareholder vote. Well, they had warrants and the warrants would be worthless if the deal didn't go through. So you don't have a shareholder vote. I think your hands are tied with respect um, to the sponsor's conflict. And the board conflict, maybe maybe things could be put into, the decision could be put into the hands of a special committee. But that would also be a very different SPAC process because the sponsor is so involved in finding the merger uh, partner, negotiating the merger. This couldn't be a special committee from the get-go, which is what the courts prefer. Um, now, um, can, can we toss, why don't we jump ahead to slides, which has some of this content on it. Sure. There you go. So I, I guess, but even before that, Mike, so you're, you're suggesting there are a couple of things. I mean, so, so first off, the affiliations between the sponsor and the directors, you know, it, in many ways, 
that's not a new problem and it's not a problem that's specific to specs, right? Mm -hmm. um, in, in other corporate boards, you have affiliations and you have, um, and I mean, that's not to say that Delaware recently, right, in other cases hasn't found other relationships, um, personal relationships between directors and, and management um, to be problematic, even if technically those relationships don't um, don't uh, challenge the independence definition. But it, it, and in in particular segments like clo the closed end fund world, the mutual fund world, um, you have you it, almost all the boards are the same of of sponsors. So it, it's kind of it's a little, you know, it doesn't even ring true to suggest that you have to have boards that are completely unaffiliated or have no ties whatsoever. But in theory, I mean, you could have a, you could have a SPAC and you could have directors that have no ties to the sponsor that are chosen because they have industry knowledge in the industry that the SPAC is choosing. To, um, to make its point of, of focus and that have, um, and you could restructure the compensation of the directors in, in a manner such that um, they would not, you know, wouldn't necessarily be um, as conflicted. So do you think that those two things, <coughs> which are relatively easy to accomplish, would, in light of you know other cases that you're familiar with, do you think that those two things would be would help in terms of overcoming a little bit of the burden or not not enough? Well, I think the way you put it, I would agree with you. It would help a little bit in overcoming. The, it would help a little bit. In the end, you still have a spec sponsor that's conflicted inherently and very involved. If you went even further out and you said, well, we're going to take the sponsor out of the process, well, that would be a dramatic change. I don't know the sponsors would want to do that. Then you might get close to what Delaware has accepted in the past. Um, the analogy to mutual funds, as, a, as I'm sure you know, that gets into yet another lawsuit. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I, yeah. Um, there are other protections there, but, but yeah. in a typical merger, Delaware is pretty strict about the independence of boards and the i'm sorry the independence of a special committee and when they start their work so if they're pulled in at the last minute the court doesn't take it very seriously uh if they start the if they're if they're engaged from the beginning of a merger process then the court does it does take it seriously but a spac merger process is the whole spac so it's it's hard to do um but right I think but, it could be but worth by the try. same token mike a SPAC is a different animal, right? The only reason that people are interested in uh, or oftentimes interested in a SPAC is because of the track record of the sponsor. And so if you took the sponsor and the sponsor's selection and the sponsor's expertise and the sponsor's success in identifying assets or operating companies that are worthwhile out of the process, then the whole investment thesis goes out the window, right? Absolutely, it, would, it wouldn't work. Now, what you could though do, I, I don't know if their sponsors on the call, they might not be happy with this, <laughs> but they could change their compensation entirely to align it completely with shareholders. Um, the earnouts that they have, I've, I've done other research on that, that just doesn't work. And it's probably a side point that we shouldn't get into. I, I think what you're saying Anna, is similar to what I'm saying is SPACs are kind of stuck uh, in, in the sense of getting around what Delaware looks for in a normal merger is gonna be very, very difficult for them. Which only means by the way, uh, and I think Brian said this, is they're gonna look closely. It's gonna be entire fairness review. That doesn't mean they lose the case. It does mean they lose the motion to dismiss and it's mm -hmm. an expensive lawsuit. Um, so I, I'm actually probably about halfway between you two. I, I think in controller situations, Delaware law definitely recognizes that you can have a majority independent board 
or other protections so that as long as um, there are ways to structure a board, I think it would have to, you'd have to align the board in my view uh, with the class A shareholders um, that their incentives match. But I think you could create an independent board that likely that would have a chance of getting out of this. It, it's even in a controller situation, you can structure a board either through a special committee or majority independent. Um, Michael's right that, you know, it's sort of the special committee needs to be there from the beginning. So I think if you're designing your SPAC and you want to have an independent board and rely on sort of either a special committee or independence, you'd want to get that sort of, you know, prior to considering the specific transaction, even if it's not at the date that the SPAC is set up. Um, but there's at least ways that you can create, um, you know, reasonable pushback on the entire fairness. Um, you can structure a board to do that. So I think it is it's possible, but it it, it 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 will have to be done with sort of great care, I guess it would be my view. Um, I think we actually, all three of us agree, because because Brian, you said have a chance. Anna said help a little. I agree, <laughs> with, I, I agree with that. I, I think okay. it will be, we would have to see, it might take several cases to figure out exactly how much has to be done, but yes, there is a chance it might help a little. And, Mike, did you want to comment on another case or? Yeah, yeah. So this, now this I have to disclose, this is a case on which I'm a consultant for the plaintiff side. So perhaps I'm biased. On the other hand, I'm involved in the case because it stems from my research. Um, and the thesis of the case is identical to my research. And I wasn't biased in my research. Um, nonetheless, that's the full disclosure. The case is called um, Gig, Gig3 Acquisitions, uh, Delman v. Gig3 Acquisitions. Um, that case is coming up. It just the briefing just ended. The it follows uh, multi-plan to a T with respect to all threshold issues, with respect to the entire fairness review. Um, but the but the claim of uh, failure of disclosure is quite different, and that's that's always going to be the case. Um, the claim here is that Gig Three failed to disclose the extent to which it had diluted and dissipated cash by the time they got to the merger. And the flip side of dissipating cash, as I could explain, um, is that the value of the target almost has to be misstated. If you're claiming your shares are worth $10, but you only have $5 in cash in them, you got to compensate that for that by misstating the value of the target. So that's the claim in, in gig three. Um, the focus is on the, the miss, the, the failure to disclose how much cash per share was in the uh, in the SPAC, and we'll see what happens. Um, you know, it's 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 a, a claim of a failure of disclosure for purposes of the redemption decision. So it it follows multi plan, pretty much right down the line. The threshold issues that are here on the slide were the ones that the multi plan defendants kind of threw against the wall, and the uh, you know, the court really dismissed them out of hand. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. If, if that case uh, is not dismissed, um, that goes to the heart of SPACs. Um, SPACs differ in the extent to which they do dilute cash, um, but they all do, they all have to, to some degree. Um, it may or may not be material in some cases, but it is material in others. So I think that will be the first case that really goes to the heart of the structure, um, or at least the disclosure of that, the dilution that's at the heart of the structure. And we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, you know, the briefs are, are there and available. Um, um, that's, that's that one. Yeah, I and, I, and I'll do say, I, I do find it interesting and it is different than multi-plan. Right. I mean, multi-plan is going to the facts of the key customer relationship and what was disclosed sort of about the business of the target going forward. Um, with the allegations in Gig Three, and obviously I've you know had a chance to look through some of the briefing, really goes to the structure. And I think there it does lend itself to more questions about how were there sufficient disclosures around the structure such that it was known that there is, as you said. All of them dissipate cash to some extent, um, you know, and so, you know, I, I think there's real questions in that one about the adequacy of the disclosure. And it also seems to me, it seems to more almost result, and this is my opinion, 
uh, Michael, is that it sees the more result from the fact that the original IPO, um, that they know at that point that they're going to be diluted when they invest. So I, I find I, that one, I think it bears a lot of interest because it does go to what is the SPAC structure. And so we'll see how that one plays out. And I do, it, because of the um, non-disclosure allegations are different than multi-plan, certainly could end up you know, being different. Can I, and I don't know, Anne, if you want to comment on that, there is a piece of multi-plan I do want to go back and pick up at some point, but we can sort of continue this conversation first. Brian, go ahead. No, this is as good a time as any. To... All right, so why don't we, can we go back to slide 12 for a minute, please? Um, and I think this is part of the cautionary tale of a multi-plan. So um, the answer to the complaint was filed um, last week. And, and the lawyers in that case did something that's not typical. They essentially attached a brief um, at the front of their answer, sort of giving their views of all of the facts. And there's a couple of things that are interesting. And I think it, the reason this is a cautionary tale is it, and this also harkens to something that Mike said a few minutes ago, is it just because you have entire fairness doesn't mean you're gonna lose. And so this answer lays out their version of what happened, um, you know, that the lawyers put in ahead of answering the allegations. And they basically go in and talk about how Muddy Waters, who issued the report, has now been subject to an SEC investigation and potentially FBI subpoenas to going at its documents, that it's a short seller that benefited from its report. Um, it also describes the extensive diligence done, including meetings with the key customers and that there was disclosures around the software. And then it goes on to show that the results afterwards, that this customer hasn't left. In fact, revenue and the relationships extended and that the software program being internally developed doesn't actually compete with MultiPlan's product and will not result in United Health being lost as a customer. And so, um, and why this is both, you know, you know, so one, you can win on entire fairness. You can go in and show that what they're alleging wasn't disclosed, in fact, wasn't, you know, um, wasn't true, for example. Um, but it also is part of the cautionary tale. You can't do this on a motion to dismiss. So you're now going to be essentially in litigation and having to deal this, deal with this through uh, discovery and, you know, look for some other exit to the case if you know, as here, multi-plans versions of the facts are in fact prove out to be accurate. And so I think, you know, and that's why um, the structure creates risk, um, the inability to get rid of cases early, likely, um, but that doesn't mean cases are necessarily gone as the facts play out, um, particularly when you start considering that a lot of the disclosures are reports by short sellers that are, their motivations are being questioned um, not just by the defendants in this case, but you know, also purported, uh, reportedly by the SEC. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how this case plays out on a factual level. Um, I will say plaintiffs probably accomplished much of what they wanted already in multi-plan by getting the ruling um, that they wanted, the questions facts that they'll now be able to cite. Um, but obviously, you know, how this case plays out remains to be seen. I don't know if you have any comments on that, Anna or Michael, or uh, so. Well, I think I'll, I'll, so. I say I agree with I, I once again. I think I agree with yeah. what you're saying. Um, so have we covered the potential responses, and are we on to the disclosure related claims at this point, which we can touch on shortly, or is there? Um, something else you wanted to cover before then. Anna. Yeah, just just before that, we did get a question, and it is it is on our responses. The idea of a fairness opinion. Um, so one of the questions is, how much does a, a fairness opinion help? <clears throat> um, and you know, I think this goes to being helpful in the context of how ultimately. Um, the case, a case in terms of evaluating the entire fairness would come out. Um, and Brian, you know, I obviously having um, had a, a thorough analysis of the issues and uh, an expert come in and express an opinion on uh, the fairness from a financial um, point of view. 
to the disinterested stockholders would, would be useful. Um, I'm not sure that that alone is determinative without any of the other, you know, without any of the other measures that we talked about. I don't think any one, um, there's not one silver bullet here, but I, I certainly think it's, it's a useful step. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that's, um, you know, consistent with what Delaware courts look at in typical situations. Like if you have an independent board or a special committee with its own advisors, both like legal and financial advisors, and they're the beneficiary of a fairness opinion, you're now sort of creating the structures around where the courts, you know, um, would, you know, could conclude that entire fairness doesn't apply. But I think it, it's additive to the other things that we've talked about. I think I, I would just add one more thing, and I, I suspect once again we're going to agree. It, it has to be a legitimate fairness opinion with real analysis of the value of the target. There are fairness opinions being written now that that simply are not are not that. I, I happen to have one up on my screen, uh, and it it says you know we're evaluating the value of the company, ignoring the fact that. Um, I'm sorry, the, the, we're, we're treating the value of a, of a SPAC share as, 10, as $10, ignoring the fact, it says this, that sponsor shares have been issued at a nominal price, ignoring the fact that there are warrants out there. It, I mean, and then it says, to the extent any of this is not true, then ignore this fairness opinion. So I think if a court were to look at this, they would say, okay, we'll ignore that fairness opinion. So it's gotta be a legitimate fairness opinion. All right, but so we can just on the disclosure claims, um, which we can um, go. I think um, in the first slide, slide fifteen, the next one. I, I think this was yours, Michael. Do you have? Um, yeah, I put together the data. Yeah, um, and so I. Um, the reason, main reason to mention this, and do you want to comment on the data, Michael? Sure, I can. I can. Yeah, sure. I guess it might be a little bit cryptic that that. Um, I think maybe let's start at the bottom. The, the majority of cases out there, and incidentally, well, as I say in the note, this ignores the nuisance suits or merger objection suits that settle for mootness fees. Um, those are about 50 for what it's worth since the beginning of 2020. But the majority of these, as you see, are the bottom misstatement after the merger. The, these cases almost always have nothing to do with the fact that the company was a, was a SPAC or came out of a SPAC merger. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, they almost shouldn't even be here, but they're, when people talk about the high volume of SPAC litigation, they include these. Um, I think the, the important ones are the, the third down, the misstatement in the merger proxy, which is what we were talking about in the context of Delaware. Now these are uh, securities uh, class actions. Um, uh, generally, when there's a Delaware case, there is a parallel securities class action. So I think we can still take these as, as totals in a sense. Um, misstatement in IPO, you got to try hard to do that. You know, if you're just collecting enough cash. Um, and I think that was a pretty questionable case. Um, the, the same is true of misstatements prior to the merger. So we're really back to the misstatements in the merger proxy, which can attract um, uh, securities class actions under Section 10 or 14A, or potentially Section 11. Um, on the next slide, on to which is his note about what it didn't include, there are a bunch of disclosure-related claims. So when you're seeing total numbers of SPAC cases and the litigation explosion or the boom, a lot of them are these disclosure-only claims, uh, which you get in almost all public company merger cases outside of the SPAC context. And we don't need to spend a lot of time on them, but there's, you know, a lot of state court complaints. Like if you see the ones that are talking about um, fiduciary duty claims in the state of New York, I actually think that those are largely disclosure related claims that they're seeking a mootness fee. They're not real cases. Um, so I think Michael's data stripping these out shows that there is a significant amount of litigation around SPACs. Um, but there's a lot of it is just sort of these standard cases where plaintiff's firms are trying to get a mootness fee. Um, they're handled sort of in the background and they largely go away. Um, and I think really absent some post DSPAC event that causes into question about the disclosures in the 
proxy like MultiPlan um, or some of these others where there's short seller reports. You know, these are just sort of the standard cases that are um, handled in the background. And I'll say a lot of them now are not resulting even in complaints being filed. There's this whole universe of demand letters um, that are issued as soon as the uh, preliminary proxy or other filing goes out. Um, and they start sort of, these plaintiff's firms start essentially uh, starting the process to see if they can get in the industry. Uh, so then it's like, I think the next slide is starting on the post DSPAC litigation, which I think is that category three that um, uh, Michael was referring to. And that's the claims that are arising after the transaction. And there's been, you know, as my, you know, the data showed quite a few of these. Um, and then the claims can either be triggered by short seller reports, which is, you know, we give some of the examples down there, including Clo Clover Health um, or other, you know, shortfalls so that there was projections included um, or otherwise that then the actual results fall short of what's expected. Multi-plan loss of key customer was the allegation. And so there are all events that are sort of disclosed after the DSPAC that um, cause questions relating to the disclosure, the disclosures relating to that transaction. Um, and they can be brought as fiduciary duty claims or securities only actions. Um, and so I think the uh, next slide, and I don't know, Michael, if you want to weigh in on this, but it's sort of the types of claims that can be brought, um, you know, sort of expanding on what you had said earlier, I'm happy to cover it anyway. Sure, I mean, just, just to clarify that, it, 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 what we just talked about were disclosure problems in the merger that came to light later, which that's right. usually when they do come to light. The category four are the ones that I think are maybe more interesting than the mootness fee extortion cases, but um, but don't have much to do with the SPAC. So the, the, these are the ones I think that are are important and they can be brought under Section 10B, which requires uh, C enter, that is intentionality or a high degree of recklessness. In some cases, they can be brought under Section 11 of the Securities Act, which uh, does not, um, only requires negligence on the part of any individual defendant, um, strict liability on, on the part of the issuer. But you need special circumstances for Section 11 to actually work. And there aren't that many of those Section 11 cases. So for the most part, it's Section 10B, um, which requires uh, uh, intentionality or a high degree of recklessness. That's hard to prove. So these are not easy cases to bring. Now, now Brian, you don't have Section 14A here. Is that, uh, is that on another slide? Um I doesn't, but you're welcome. It does not, but you're welcome to bring the okay. discuss 14A. I'm not sure that it's uh, uh, I'm mentioned on another side. So. Yeah, so it, I mean that 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 there is there is a possibility. There's some complications that um, uh, of a suit that is something in between a, a negligence standard and a scienter standard, depending on the circuit. Um, those are actually based on failure to inform the vote, which creates uh, a, another set of um, issues involving causation. Um, it's not clear that any information is even relative to, relevant to the vote, because as I said, uh, shareholders that hold warrants want the merger to go through, even if they're gonna get rid of their shares. So these cases are very uncertain. I, I mean, I think that's why uh, we could well see many more cases filed in Delaware uh, with respect to disclosing disclosure related to the redemption decision rather than securities class actions uh, in other states. Yeah, and I think I agree with that. On the 14A, loss causation is a problem and damages is a problem. I, and I think there's, uh, I'm not aware of a case that has actually successfully <laughs> proceeded under a 14A disclosure claim and so I think at those, if those are the, if those are the persuasive allegations around disclosure, I, I think I do agree. That's one that you would expect to see in the um, in Chancery Court in Delaware bringing a breach of fiduciary duty claims, because uh, that that seems to be law that's more developed to handling those types of claims. But 14A claims, I'm not aware of one that's actually successfully resulted in a significant damages 
um, being awarded to a plaintiff class. Um, it's just very difficult under the federal law, I think. Um, that type of but, but once again, as you said, Brian, you might not get a dismissal of a complaint and then there's pressure to settle. Right. And that's the that's name right. of the game in securities class actions. Um, and then next slide, I think, is going back to gig three, which I think uh, was you as well, Michael, if there's more to cover here. Uh, no, I didn't know it was coming up again. I think we covered it. If we're good. Then we're good. Um, I would say um, just as an example, um, just on Clover Health, and I think that this is an example, and I'm just focused, I'm pointing it out because it was reported this week um, that the motion to dismiss uh, was denied in Clover Health. I think um, this is one of the categories of cases where it seems more like an IPO 10B case, um, you know, just sort of a, a standard sort of securities fraud case that isn't really connected to the SPAC related transaction. It became public through, the, through a DSPAC transaction. Um, it is, you know, one of the um, SPAC king is what it's referred to as the guy who was the sponsor of this. Uh, but it's not really, there's a gloss of the SPAC on top of it. But this, I think I would view it as sort of, it's sort of a straightforward securities litigation of, you know, the results uh, post-closing not being sort of consistent with what um, had been expected leading to a stock price decline. And we mentioned it just because it is being, you know, counted as a category of the SPAC litigation, and it's a pretty good example where the court, even applying the PSLRA standards, uh, denied a motion to dismiss. Um, I think that's it for me on sort of the litigation. I don't know if there's any cleanup anybody wants to add around to sort of the litigation around SPACs. Well, I'll talk a little bit about enforcement. Um, and so we're also seeing the SEC's enforcement division focus on SPACs, um, two, uh, two matters, um, Stable Road and, and uh, the Nicola case, which I'm not gonna go through. So Stable Road <coughs> has gotten probably the most attention. I think that uh, since Nicola had uh, already been the subject of litigation, um, had that had already attracted a fair bit of attention. Um, so in Stable Road, um, this was a situation where uh, the, the SPAC had um, announced a merger with um, a, uh, a satellite um, company. It was very early stage. And uh, what the SEC found was uh, in this case, there were a couple of issues. So first off, um, there were some security uh, concerns given that um, satellites require FCC licensing uh, among other things. And there are some defense aspects of the strategy. Um, the national security concerns involving the CEO, which hadn't been fully vetted, um, actually um, were, uh, an impediment to the company, critical to the company's operations and to the company's business plan going forward. Um, we'll go on to the next slide. So um, there hadn't been adequate diligence done in that respect. There also hadn't been adequate diligence done um, with respect to where the company was in terms of advancing um, its business plan. And um, as a result, um, there were uh, significant uh, misstatements and omissions in uh, the materials relating to uh, the transaction. So uh, the SEC <coughs> claimed that uh, the disclosure failures amounted to, to violations of um, 10B, 10B5, uh, Section 14A, 14A9 of the 34 Act, and, and uh, the fraud statute, Section 17A. So uh, there's a fair bit of interesting language in the order that goes through um, the expectations regarding the sponsor's um, role, if you will, as um, a gatekeeper and the sponsor's obligations to undertake 
um, significant diligence in the process of um, identifying the target and in the DSPAC process, um, which here, of course, um, was, was insufficient and, and ultimately is um, what led to the disclosure failings. Um, as one of the remedies, uh, the, there was a, as we've already discussed, as with so many DSPAC transactions, there was a concurrent uh, pipe transaction. The pipe um, purchasers were essentially uh, given rescission rights. They were given the opportunity to terminate their subscription uh, agreements and not go forward. Um, <clears throat> and there were certain remedies that the company undertook to take going forward um, to address its disclosure controls and procedures. So in uh, the Nicola case, um, which um, the, in, in the enforcement matter, again, the SEC found um, deficient find, found deficiencies in the, in the company's disclosure controls and procedures as it related to um, the control persons making certain claims in social media relating to the company, the products, the state of the products, um, a failure uh, on the part of the company um, to have in place disclosure controls and procedures, and of course, um, issues relating to um, gatekeepers and the there not being any checks um, by the board or governance procedures that would have addressed um, the uh, disclosures that were made by somebody on the company's behalf, um, really acting um, for uh, the company or speaking for the company. So issues that, that really come up in, in all of these matters, and obviously we'll go on to the next section here, um, that come through for all of these that we've talked about for all of these. We've already talked a little bit about uh, independence issues, the board issues. We've talked a little bit about conflicts of interest. We have not um, yet talked about uh, the diligence to be undertaken. So the enforcement actions, and these two are probably just two of, of, of many. I, I suspect that there will be more to come in uh, the, the SPAC um, market. Highlight uh, the expectations regarding the diligence obligations of really all of the parties. Uh, the SPAC sponsor, uh, the financial intermediaries that are involved in the process, the firms that are involved in the process, um, which <coughs> can be viewed <laughs> as gatekeepers. And of course, enhancing uh, enhanced due diligence would, uh, would lead to, or one would think would lead to improved um, disclosure. Um, another issue um, that uh, comes through if you read some of the uh, cases, and obviously if you read um, some of the some of the other statements that the SEC um, and the SEC's Investor Advisory Committee um, and uh, other commentators have been noting, and that comes up in some of the, the the cases we've been talking about, is just disclosure of dilution and disclosure of the interests of various parties and the financing transactions that accompany the DSPAC. So by that, I would be, you know, I'm referring to the pipe transaction. Oftentimes now in these DSPACs, we see non-redemption agreements. We see um, some uh, forfeiture of, of sponsor equity, uh, of, of sponsor interests and sharing of sponsor interests with institutional investors that are also putting up uh, new money. So um, concerns regarding the, the adequacy um, and the, the detail or lack of detail uh, relating to all of these transactions, which um, may uh, be important to, to the stockholders that, that are being asked to vote on uh, the transaction. So all, all things to consider 
Mike, I don't know if you want to comment uh, in particular on disclosure of dilution or some of the disclosure relating to um, financial interests of, of various parties. I know that's something you've thought a lot about. Yeah, for about three years. Dilution, you know, that, that's what my research is focused on primarily. Um, it's very hard to disclose it. I mean, I'll, to be honest, uh, what I believe should be disclosed is that a SPAC typically when it is merging has about five, six dollars of cash left in it with the rest being taken out by the sponsor, the warrant holders, banks, financial advisors seem to come out of the woodwork at the time of a, of a DSPAC. Often the total fees paid to financial advisors are higher than the underwriting fee. Um, uh, the, I'm not clear that there's full disclosure of side payments made to pipe investors. Of course, if it's not disclosed, I can't be clear on it. But in, in um, Churchill, the, the same uh, SPAC that was involved in the multi-plan case, there was a Wall Street Journal article that found that, or they reported that Michael Klein had paid a lot of his sponsor interests to others. And I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe it said including investors, which would be pipe, could be pipe investors. And yet that was not, as far as I know, I don't believe it was in any of the uh, disclosed in SCC filings. So I think it would be useful for the SEC. I think it's difficult for any single SPAC to volunteer all this stuff. It would be very useful for the SEC to uh, issue a set of regulations that puts everybody on an even playing field with a lot more disclosure than there is out there right now. Okay, well, um, since the SEC we know is, is um, or the SEC staff is, is thinking about proposed recommendations and um, dilution is certainly one of the things that was um, mentioned in the legislation that's been proposed in Congress. I'm sure that we'll see that surface. So thank you very much to Professor Klausner for joining us today. We enjoyed having you and, and hearing your perspectives. Thanks so much. And um, thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon.